Good morning, everyone. Yvonne's here with our November Mornings with Mayish. I'm gonna give you guys a few minutes to come on in and join us before we get started with all of our amazing questions that you guys submitted for today's show. Um, and in the meantime, I'm just gonna go through our normal introductions and housekeeping. So I'm gonna be here today with Shelly and Dave answer your flower questions. And I'm just so impressed with all of the responses that I received, guys. I have over 50 questions that were submitted for today's show. Now, of course, we don't have time to go over all 50 questions. So I picked my top 10 to 15 for the season. It was based mainly on season. We had a lot of seasonal questions that we're going to be going over today. I also have Desi in my control room, and she's going to be helping out posting links and answering questions in the comment section. So feel free to post those com those questions. Even if we don't have time to go over them, I will answer them in a future show. I promise. Uh, also, I would love for you guys to say hello in the comments and let us know where you guys are watching from or listening from if you're listening. And also, I wanted to make sure that you guys all know that I will be posting the replay of this show in and the show notes on our blog. And if you haven't heard, also, we will have a podcast of the show. So if you just want to be listening, we offer that as well. And actually, I've been doing a lot more um podcast, like listening on my own to all some of my favorite people um, while I'm exercising and driving and cooking. So it's just a really great way to kind of absorb and catch up with all of your favorite content without actually having to sit down and do it. So take advantage of that. Uh, also, I wanted to let you guys know, of course, that today's show is brought to you by the Mayish Design Star Flower Workshop Tour. Our 2018 tour is finished. We just had our Salt Lake uh, workshop uh, I think it was last week and it was beautiful. It turned out amazing. And, but now we're going to be starting to promote our 2019 workshop tour. And we actually got a question from Claudia about if we had a list of workshop dates for next year. And I do, and I'm going to share them here with you. Before I talk about the dates though, I wanted to make sure that you know that we're going to go live with our workshop, selling our tickets on Monday, Cyber Monday. Um, so we have something fun planned for that and a little bit of a giveaway. So make sure that you tune in on Monday. Um, so in terms of the dates, guys, we're going to be uh, doing our big grand opening workshop, our first one. Uh, inaugural workshop, if you will, uh, January 14th through the 15th in San Diego. Then we're going to be heading to Nashville in May, May 20th and 21st. Then we're heading over to Austin in August, August 12th through the 13th. And then we're going to wrap things up in November, the 11th and 12th in Columbus, Ohio. So I hope that you guys can join us in one of those cities. It's going to be amazing. Sean Strong, um, we already love working with him and we haven't even really got started. So um, you guys are going to love him if you don't already. Also, I wanted to make sure that you guys know that Black Friday is coming up. And P.S. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I love this time of year. Thanksgiving is actually one of my favorite holidays and um, it just it's fun just to be spending some quality family time. So I hope that you guys have a wonderful Thanksgiving. But after you are done eating your pumpkin pie and turkey and all things, um, I hope that you guys check out our email that we'll send out on Thursday or on Wednesday on Thanksgiving. No, Thursday. Sorry, guys. On Thursday, um, so that way you get to know what our Black Friday special is going to be. It's all about Mayish Market. Um, so if you guys like to buy flowers online, check that out. It's going to be fun. Love this time of year. Also, I wanted to let you guys know that we, I don't have the actual cup yet, but I have this cup. It's like this type of cup, you know, where... It's like a to-go cup and it's plastic and it's my actually favorite kind of cup to use. Um, I use these like every single day. But we made our own Mornings with Mayish version. They um, they were a little bit back ordered. And so we are still picking our favorite questions from each show and we will be sending you guys um, a Mornings with Mayish cup. So how cool. Super, super excited about these cute little coffee cups. Um, we've had people ask for them. And so they are finally here, almost here. 
And again, guys, 50 questions, almost 50 questions. So um, it's literally enough content for the next four to five shows. We're gonna try and answer as many questions as possible so we don't have that huge backlog. But I just wanted to thank you again for all of the questions that you guys have sent in. Keep them coming. You can send them however. Um, most of the people send me via email and you can email me at yashton at mayish.com. Um, if you're on our email list, you see my email come through quite often, a couple times a month, I think. Um, so just reply to one of those and that'll get to me for sure. Um, I also, guys, have you guys seen this month's issue of Florist Review, Floral Renaissance. So we um, were honored to work with Sue McCleary and Hitomi and supplied many of the flowers. Let's go this way. Oh, look at that bouquet. So gorgeous. Um, so be sure to check that out. It's a beautiful issue. Um, and we had fun working and his team and Sue McCleary um, creating this amazing photo shoot in, in Italy for you guys. And we were able to do that because we have our Mayish Destination Events Program, if you guys didn't know, and we can oftentimes send flowers all over the world. We actually, another example of that is we have um, a big event that we are helping sponsor the flowers for, for Munalucci, and they're doing a big retreat in Bermuda. So um, it's going to be amazing. So if you guys don't know about that and you want to go to Bermuda in December, check that out. All right. Last but not least, make sure that you save the date for our next show. It's going to be December 11th and we'll be here at 10 a.m. Eastern time. And I think that's it, guys. So let me just go through some good mornings. Um, uh, Kristen says, can you send an email out about Sean Strong's workshops? Yes. That email will be going out on Monday. So, and we're going to be posting, it's going to be up on the blog. It's going to be all over social media. We're going to do a big giant kind of PR blast for that for sure. Um, good morning, Ryan. Hi, Penny. Welcome to the show guys. Good morning, Mary and Renee. Hello. Hello. Um, so keep it, keep it coming guys. All right, so let me bring on Dave and Shelly, and we are going to get started with today's show. Good morning, Good guys. Morning. Good morning, Yvonne. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Not too bad. Staying <laughs> warm. It's a little chilly out there. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the chilly part is, really. We, we had a cold front come through, uh, like, the beginning of this week and it was like in the 60s so that's people wearing earmuffs <laughs> in south florida <laughs> which i still get a kick out of i'm not used to that at all because i am from cleveland and so 60s is still it's still nice i mean it's a little chilly at night um but it's all good so i hope that you all stay warm <laughs> Got the sweater on right now. <laughs> yeah, I wore I wore a sweater too. Okay. Got to take advantage of the times, right? Yeah, I love it because it's Thanksgiving and it actually feels cold here in California, so it's nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's good. So I know we have a big agenda, guys, to get through today, and so Shelly, I was going to have you kick it off and show us some pretties. Well, I'm going to show you a couple things right now and then some other things a little little later because we're going to talk about drives later. But um, these are some Kahala roses that I was um, opening at the warehouse this week. These are already a week old. I don't know if you guys um, are familiar with Kahala. It's not one that gets ordered a lot, but it's a beautiful so color good there. Corally peach lighter in the center. And it's got a darker outer color. It's almost an ombre. It's beautiful. It's a really nice rose. And it, it opens really well. Again, I can't say it enough, but make sure you're getting your flowers opened up early. Um, these roses are a week old. So, and you can see that one of my tricks I always teach in our classes is how to, to make them look a little more like a garden rose and blow them out open um, and get them really big. So, Make sure, especially when it's a high petal count rose, you do that. And then I just wanted to show you guys, it's not a new product, but it's uh, seasonal right now. And how beautiful our peonies are looking, the fall peonies are looking. Again, I think I got a little glare. I'm going to back up a little bit. 
Um, these are Festiva Max, and these also are a week old. I've already been working on them. These, these kinds of flowers need help opening up too because they get real coned at the top and you have to use your fingers. That's where in nature ants come in. They'll kind of help open peonies up. But they're really nice. We're really surprised, I think, this year with the fall product. The peonies are beautiful where they kind of can look like golf balls sometimes. But all of them have, like, like the coral charms are huge. So, so that's all I'm going to show you. I'm fresh because I've got some dries I want to talk about when we do the dried section there. So, <laughs> great. So, yeah, awesome. Do you want to just go down the line, Dave? Do you have anything you want to show today? Sure. I just brought a couple things because I know we got a lot to cover on the show. Um, this is a relative of the poinsettia family. It's Euphorbia, and the name is Bliss. And it's just kind of fun. We've been getting it for the last few weeks. It's an unusual take on a poinsettia. So I wanted to show that. I believe this is a Dutch import at the moment. That's but, so cool. Yeah. I've never um, seen that before. You know, I think this is the first year we've been carrying that from recollection. And then I'm going to do a blast from the past because I haven't seen these since the 90s. And someone resurrected them. I don't know the origin of it. We were trying to research it before the show, and unfortunately, we couldn't come up with all of the information. But these are Killian daisies. Um, they used to be extremely popular for St. Patrick's Day back in the 90s when that was a thing. Um, people don't really celebrate that with flowers anymore. Um, but this is a take on it that's got kind of a lacy edge on the petal. So just really unique, really kind of snowflake looking. So I thought that would be a good segue into Christmas. Yeah, it looks a little bit like the the Garando. Am I saying that right? The Garando Gerber? Yeah, it, it is slightly reminiscent of a Gerbera, um, almost spidery, like the spider gerbs. Mm -hmm. So the last thing I want to show, and I, I, I'm not a big fan of painted flowers. You guys know this. But these <laughs> have blown up in popularity so much that we can't seem to keep them in stock. They sell out every week. Um, the Dutch are now painting plumosa fern, and they're doing it in such a in such a good way that I mean it's not clumpy at all. It maintains the laciness of the fern, but this is the rose gold color, which they actually call champagne. The like 24 karat gold color and the bronze color, but I mean amazing. This is perfect for Christmas. They're available right now. Um, ask your sales rep at Mayash. I love the rose gold. That's like my favorite. favorite and in the tradition of Formosa, it still does shed. So I will put that uh, disclaimer out. <laughs> so, that's what I, today. I wanted to focus on questions. So. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. I did get a, a question real quick from Veronica, and I think it's in regards to the first product that you showed. And she wanted to know, is it long lasting? Um, it, like euphorbia, all euphorbia is, it does bleed milk when you break the leaves off. So it's got that sap that comes out of it. Um, this actually is quite a long lasting flower. It goes at least a week in our cooler. Um, I haven't base tested it yet in the office where it's about 72 degrees, but, um, you can tell this by touching it. It's very turgid. It has a nice, you know, strong leathery feel to it. It's not, um, wimpy per se. So yeah, I think it's a pretty long laster. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have something to show and tell, which is a little hey. bit unusual. Um, but I have these cute little guys. Let's see. And I've already got asked about those. <laughs> yeah, the preserved gardenias. Um, Brian, my husband, who's the Miami branch manager, brought them home. And um, they're amazing. They're preserved and they'll last at least six months. And they come in four blooms. Let me show you again. Four blooms in a box. They're 100% natural, grown in soil, harvested at their peak bloominess. And they don't need any water or light. And they also <coughs> come in other colors. Dave's favorite. Uh, burgundy, cranberry, and cherry blossom. I have a box that came in for me so I can take photos of it. Um, but it came in over the weekend and Mondays are crazy and Brian forgot to bring them home for me. So boo, Brian, um, but <laughs> I'll have them soon and take those pictures. I will update 
the blog post that we have up on the blog. We'll post that link um, in the comments for you guys. So you can check that out after the show. Of course, it'll be in the um, show notes as, as well. And um, we'll share it on social media too. So just, I love, there's so many cool preserved products right yeah. now. And I just thought that was fun because gardenias are so touchy and finicky and they bruise easily. And these little guys are pretty cool. I love them. So fun. You know, they're freeze dried or how are they preserving them? Um, I'm not quite sure. I know. I'm not sure. It just says preserved. That's all it says. I don't think that they're freeze dried, but I could be totally wrong. They, they feel like, um, the freeze dried garden roses from Alexandra farms, but that's, that's all I know. Sorry. What? <laughs> 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 yeah, very cool. All right, so we'll move on to our first question from Carrie. She says, since it's amaryllis season, she's wondering if there's any way to speed up getting them to open. They are they can be tricky sometimes. Yeah, opening time can vary depending on the stage that they're cut, but usually planting three to five days is sufficient. As with all flowers, planting your seed time is really crucial. Some things are going to open quicker than others. Um, there's quick dips available in fall foods that can help stimulate the flowers opening, you know, more quickly. But nothing's going to work better than having them arrive in plenty of time to open naturally. On a side note, did you know that amaryllis, like most other bulb flowers, can be stored in a closed dry box for about a week or more in your cooler? So you can actually order them a week ahead and that gives you time to work on them, you know, get them open with some TLC. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the biggest problem. People get amaryllis the week they need it and they don't think that they can get them earlier. And we sell a lot of amaryllis at our location. And if you will get that box in earlier, they can take almost a full week to open up and they last well. So make sure you are and then cut cut them short if you're not needing them tall. You can cut them short if they're for bouquet work or whatever. That'll help too. Lovely. Um, I just wanted to address this question real quick. Jessica asks, do the preserved gardenia smell? And unfortunately, no. The smell is all gone. And um, but they they stay pretty and they don't get brown and, and bruised. <laughs> <laughs> Good question though, Jessica. Thank you. Um, all right. Next question up is from Ruth. She said, with Christmas approaching, I was wondering how long to allow amaryllis to fully open using them in a December 22nd wedding. So we kind of already talked about that, but did you have anything else that you wanted to add, Dave or Shelly? Yeah, I mean, there's ways that you can definitely handle them so that they're going to perform better for you. Um, we already covered the three to five days to fully open. Um, once they start getting close to the stage you want to get them at, you can put them back in the cooler to slow their development. So that's the nice thing about buying them ahead of time and having time to work on them, you know, slowly. Um, always put them back in, cool them down, and hold them. Best practice is to make a grid of tape over the opening of your buckets and try to get them standing straight up. Uh, amaryllis are top heavy, so when they open, they have these hollow stems that can cramp or crush from the weight of the bloom falling over. Um, if they're leaning at an angle, that's not a good thing. That's going to cause damage to the stem. You might want to purchase some extra long hyacinth stakes or some skinny bamboo poles that you can insert all the way up in through the stem while you're hydrating to give them some vertical stability. Uh, the added sticks also make it easier to anchor the amaryllis in floral foam if that's the uh, medium you're going to be using uh, to do your design work with. So. Lovely. Good yeah, I posted a little flower hack on our Instagram page calls about a few weeks ago about how to deal with an amaryllis that's bent, broken, or falling over. And one of my favorite things to use is a, as a flower stem, and usually I use a tuberose stem instead of a stake. I feel sometimes with stakes they will kind of puncture the flower. So a tuberose stem is really straight and sturdy. And it doesn't have any foliage on it. And you can put that right up inside the stem of the amaryllis. And I've always used that when I'm designing with them too. It really supports the stem. And then if you tape, we use Oasis tape. And where, whenever you get the link you want, you can kind of wrap around the ends of the, of the amaryllis and that'll keep it from splitting. This happens a lot with hollow flowers. They split on the end. So that, that tuberose is a really good, good flower hack. Love yeah, it. I like that idea, reusing the tuberose stems. That's awesome. 
<laughs> yeah, because it deteriorates with the the flower at the same time too. So it's not, you know, it's, it's biodegradable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Penny says that she uses liatra stems. So that's oh. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Love the sharing. Uh, our next question is from Carrie. She said she wants to know what good options exist for pink and yellow florals in December when everything is red, green, white, gold, and silver. Lots of options. Lots of options. <laughs> Most growers will not let us cherry pick only the seasonal colors when we do our purchasing for our inventory. Since we can't buy only the in-demand colors for a particular holiday at any given time during the year, we have a full selection of both seasonal and non-seasonal colors available. Some of my favorite pink and yellow flowers in December are anthuriums, calla lilies, coxcomb celosia, cymbidium orchids, hydrangeas, sweet peas, and banda orchids. Uh, there, we do have a comprehensive flower library at mayash.com backslash flower library. Um, we also have a great yearly product guide that you can download. Yeah. We'll post the, the link for the product guide. Um, the flower library too, just be careful because I'm in charge of that. Um, but it, it's kind of sits outside of our existing, our existing systems that we manage all of our product, unfortunately. Um, and I'm not a product expert. So I have to rely on people to let me know if there's something in there that I cannot get. So there might be items in there occasionally that um, are discontinued. We might not have things that are newer in there because um, it's a beast to keep up. So I have things in the works, hopefully that will uh, correct those, those issues. Um, but it's still a good kind of reference guide. Just make sure you talk to your rep before you get your heart set on maybe a specific variety that you're not sure that really um, is available right now. Okay. Absolutely. The other, yeah, yeah. So the other thing I wanted to say is for the, the product guide, that's a really cool thing. What we did was we take um, all of the availability lists for each of the months. And so it's not super, it's not very visual. It's a very, it's very, it's like a big chart of all the flowers. We do it by month. Um, so it's a pretty big um, comprehensive guide and it'll give you a really good idea of what is available. Um, so yeah, check those out. And we'll, we posted the links in the comments so that way you guys can grab your copy of the download if you don't have it already. I wanted to say also about the colors and the, this time of year, um, just remember there's a lot of spring product coming in in December. So you're gonna, you're gonna have lots of options with tulips. Um, there's always many roses available. So there's actually quite a lot of color available. I just think it looks like it's only red, white, green when you walk in this time of year, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and then the new flower auction should be happening soon. That's usually mid December every year, and they have all kinds of cool, crazy stuff. So yeah, everyone loves that Japanese product. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, good. <laughs> Our next question, moving on on, uh, is from Sharon and she wants to know, is it difficult to get tall pampas grass with large plumes in the month of December in California? Well, not if it's growing in your yard right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, the season for fresh cut pampas grass is pretty much over. Um, we are offering dried pampas grass right now. Um, for those of you who have worked with it, you know it can shed, so you need to have a surface sealer of some sort ready. Wow, that's like a nursery rhyme there. <laughs> anyway, um, it, it does shed, so it, it's a little bit messy. Um, any suggestions, Shelley? Yeah, I mean, if if it's dried while it's fresh, it tends to shed less. And using a surface spray surface sealer always is um, um, make, is it Oasis or Design Master makes a really good brand um that you can use um we used to use old aquanet hairspray to, to seal <laughs> to seal dry so that works too if you have that on hand <laughs> but drying it. It, drying it while it's fresh dried is good mm -hmm. maybe we can mm -hmm. get aquanet to sponsor one of our podcasts that would be fun <laughs> 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 um, but specific to Sharon's question she wanted to know like the dried stuff that's available does it have large plumes the stem length of the stuff we're getting in is only about I want to say four and a half five feet long um, the plumes on it are still large 
they're very fragile though. I mean, just picking up the bundles, it was kind of snowing down little bits yeah. and pieces. I found they're not as bushy and nice for sure. And no, again, it's just the, like working with things that are in season too, you know, or drying your own for what, if you need them for later, that's always an option with dries. Um, I tell people all the time, buy them now and dry the product for when you need it later. Cause that's when you're going to use it. It's not going to die. It's dried. Yeah, somebody needs to figure out a way to do the glycerin preserving on that so that it yeah. holds the stuff together. I mean, that would be a huge market because they're so popular right now. They're pretty. Good. Good stuff, guys. Thank you. Um, next question is from Melissa. And she says, since dried flowers and greens are coming back in style, do you have any tips for handling them? Uh, she says, I feel limited in their inflexibility and worry if I pair them with fresh flowers in a water source, the stems will get soggy and fall out of place. And I know like for the gardenias, it says, do not put them in water. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm curious, yeah. uh, Shelly, what your thoughts are with that. Yeah, so with dried flowers, obviously um, they're dry. They don't have any moisture in them. So when you're using them in fresh flower arrangements, you want to create an artificial stem for them by picking and wiring and taping them. We, even at our workshop, we did at Salt Lake, uh, um, we had a really sweet florist help us with all of our product and put, process it and put it in water. And she put a lot of our preserved product in water. <laughs> so it's my job to dry it out, wring it out um, and get it back usable again. But you cannot put glycerin dyed product, glycerin dried or dyed product in water. It's very important because the dye will leach off of it you don't want it getting on um, anyone's dress or clothing or tabletops. Make sure you wire it and um, tape it. Taping will seal it. If you use wire, make sure you're using always tape wire because uh, wire can rust in water. Or use a wooden um, uh, cowie pick, the little wooden uh, like plant picks with a little wire on it, and you can tape it on. And then I did bring a few drives to show you guys too. Um, with preserving flowers, the important part of preserving flowers on your own is to dry them while they're fresh and in their prime, not when they're already going out and will to look bad. So one of the things that's been really popular, a lot of people um, up in like, I think it's Utah, Oregon, they have its clematis pods, they call it old man's beard. I dried these, aren't they darling? <laughs> So we get so cute. fresh from Holland and um, I tested them. To see, I didn't know they would do this originally. So this was new for me. I've never dried these before. They are going on two months old now and they haven't shed a bit. So this is what you should do with dries is experiment and see what works. These I was able to dry upright and they've got a very Dr. Susie who's easy to look to them and they're just really pretty and soft that's a really pretty thing to dry um this is a uh, copper beach which is preserved in glycerin and this is one of those items you cannot you should not get wet it is woody stem so it doesn't um affect it as badly but if you can pick and wire on it then you can safely put that in in fl a fresh flower foam uh, another fun thing one of my customers actually turned me on to, and I didn't realize, we, we always get questions about Lunaria and how is, do they get it like that? And one of my customers told, another customer told me, oh, it just dries and bleaches like that on the side of the road. Well, we got in fresh Lunaria early um, in the summer. And what I did is I dried it, right? And then I brought it home and put it outside and bleached it. Well, that's pretty too. But the cool thing, how you get to the, the transparent or skeletonized part of the Lunaria is by pulling off the pod. And this was a native poppy here in our San Diego area. She was so cute. She's like, look what I did, Shelly. And she sent me a picture, but it takes a minute and it's a little bit of work, but you literally have to peel off the outer pod or skin. And if you do that on, oh, do, do it on here both sides it will expose that transparent part and get that skeletonized so you see that's where the little part is i did not know that either that's so, so, that's so cool. cool yeah so now you got a lot of them to do and one of the reasons lunaria is a little expensive it's in demand plus um if that's what they're doing to get that that's a laborious process so 
Um, but that's one thing. You can experiment with so many things. I dry things all the time. Um, one thing I want to show you not to do with dried. So these are straw flower, which dry really well. But I left these upright and let them dry to show you. If you leave them upright, they're going to look wilted. So you always want to <laughs> hang them upside down and gravity will help them stay straight, turgid. And if they don't, then all you have to do if you're designing with them is take the flower head off and create a wired stem. So dries are fantastic. You can use them so many different ways. Um, if you've been to our location and my spot, you'll see my little space look like a mini flower shop because I've got so many dried shoved everywhere because we test everything. One cool thing, uh, artichoke blooms, like art, just the artichokes, if you leave the head out and let it dry on its own, the flower will actually pop out of the center and it'll dry like that. They're, they're just, there's so many fun things. So don't be afraid to experiment and uh, you'll have lots of fun. <laughs> so cool. So cool. <laughs> Learning lots of Learning things, lots today. things today. And I do plan to do, I've been saying for a while, I'm going to do a dried tutorial, um, a little video. So I will do that. And we'll talk about different products that you guys can use. Great. Thanks, Shelly. I'm getting some feedback. Dave, are you hearing it? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Shelly, do you happen to have some earbuds with you by any chance? I don't. Um, let me see if okay. I can. Does that help a little? Uh, I think so. Yep, yeah, that's yeah. better. Yeah. Sorry. Totally <laughs> went away. Thank you. <laughs> I can't steal right. my constantly and I can never find them. So. <laughs> I know, I know. I have like four pairs, so they're all over the place. And I have the one pair that I don't leave. I just keep it plugged into my mic for phone because I use it oh, all the time. Yeah, they yeah, get constantly. <laughs> yeah, I use my mic all the time for all my meetings and stuff. I love it. Okay, moving on. Uh, next question is from Roger. He says, I love working with unique floral and doing things a bit out of the box in regards to fresh arrangements. I tend to forge the landscape for bits of added interest to create those creations for to those creations. Sorry, guys. Uh, my question is when using fresh sprigs of berries like beauty berry or something I can't pronounce, bittersweet, holly, et cetera, what is the best way to keep those berries from falling off the stems besides not brushing up against them? <laughs> Foraging, also known as midnight gardening. <laughs> 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 the trick with foraging is harvesting your items at the right time. Um, berries ripen, if they ripen too far on the stem, they're not gonna hold well. This kind of gives you a limited window for any given plant or bear, with berries on it that you're foraging. Uh, these items are also subject to frost damage and other environmental conditions that can affect their uh, stability. Um, if possible, try targeting the hardier plants like rose hips, hypericum, liquid amber, blue viburnum berries, calicarpra, and tallow berry. These are all kind of landscaping things that are in the more northern hemispheres, and they tend to be pretty sturdy plants. Um, the berries hold better on them. So it's kind of knowing what you're targeting when you're doing that. Good advice. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. Shelly, did you have anything to add or are you good? No, that's good. Yep. Okay. That's, that's what you need to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next question is um, from Holly and it's more about floral design. She wants to know, how do you attach flowers to a stucco wall? Some venues have stucco walls for the altar and I've seen photos of large installations on the wall. Uh, well, they, that is a challenging wall to adhere things to. So one thing, make sure you first, before you do any installation at all, check with the venue that you have permission to do that. Uh, never go into a venue and start nailing away on things. I know this is probably a given and common sense, but I've known many floors that have gotten themselves in trouble for doing that. You can also check with the venue if it is a difficult wall like that. Sometimes they already have anchors in place or nails that they put in place for that kind of thing. So you could check with that too. There's all kinds of um, sticky tabs now available to us. If you just shop in Home Depot, uh, Lowe's, and Target probably has them too. Command makes a lot of different kinds of um, a removable, non-damaging sticky adhesive. So what sh the problem is, is what are you hanging? So on a second wall, the best thing to do is use light greenery. 
If you can use the sticky tabs and they don't damage the finish, then those will work and you can gently um, attach your greenery to that. If it's a heavier structure you need, it's better sometime to create your own armature. And that would be to make a stand or, or an arch or something out of twig. Like you can buy a pre-made arch and put it against the wall, decorate that, uh, which is probably more likely what you're seeing if it's heavy installation, because there's no other way to do that besides suspending it from the ceiling if that's right. an option. So if it's an outdoor area, you may be able to you may be able to suspend your product from the rafters and down on um, fishing line or whatever you, you can use to secure it. Um, or you may need to build your own armature. And that would be two base, two heavy bases, whether they're in urns or heavy loamy dishes that are weighted. And you can build branches up against the wall and then decorate and attach to that. So it doesn't necessarily have to be on the wall. It could be against the wall and attached to your own structure. And those are a couple of easy ways to do that. It's challenging though with stucco out, if it's an outdoor, I'm assuming since it's stucco, it's outdoor, but um, hanging it from above is another trick. So those are a few tips. Good stuff. Thanks, Shelly. Yeah. Our next question <laughs> is from the Mrs. Bakia. It's uh, from Instagram and <laughs> yeah. And uh, she wants to know also, can you give some tips for home decorating um, autumn for autumn and Thanksgiving? I think it would be interesting for people. And of course, so any, any ideas to throw out there for our last minute fall Thanksgiving designs? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, for years, we've been carving pumpkins and doing arrangements in pumpkins or putting a floral foam on top and doing flowers. I saw a really cute idea where you use the taller gourds, where mm -hmm. the gourds are almost bottle shaped and they're a, more of a neutral color. That's really fun to carve out and do a design in. It gives you kind of an upright base look. This is a great time of year to experiment and have lots of fun with dried pumpkins, corn, corn stalks, every, there's so much at your disposal. You can't really go wrong. Um, apples are great to use for carving and you can even, you can put a votive inside an apple. You can use it as a cider cup, believe it or not. There's a lot of fun things. And don't be afraid to get out of the box with color. You don't have to do the typical yellow, orange, uh, rust color theme. You could do a really, really modern, neutral and green, um, very clean look with, um, you know, the green pumpkins are beautiful. The Gerardella, I think is how it's pronounced. There's a lot of cool moody colors and pumpkins now. You can just line your table with pumpkins, pumpkins everywhere. I think autumn is one of the easiest decorating seasons. There's so much fun stuff that you can use. There's another color palette. We old school florists used to call it Thanksgiving pinks. Um, when we have clients who don't want that orangey mm -hmm. look and before the modern neutral hit so hard, that's using mauvey tones, pinky, muddy tones. Um, proteas work really well for this, like the pink ice protea, heather, uh, a lot of, you can use a lot of different colors and structure in your design with using dries and texture with those colors as well. And then incorporating little mini pumpkins or things in white. So there's a lot of really fun, fun um, things you can do with, with this time of year. Don't be afraid to experiment with your colors. You don't have to stick with the traditional ones. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Barbara. When working with floral foam, specific flowers are more challenging. What is the best method of insertion for amaryllis, calla lilies, and hydrangea? I have generally pre-inserted a stem so that the soft or hollow stems do not get clogged, but is there a better, newer method? Yeah, I think the um, cre creating a hole for bigger stems, just make sure your hole is, um, you're not tearing up your oasis and you're very you're very specific on placement and that you have good soaked oasis and a lot of water in the container. Otherwise, holes can create problems for flowers when you're pushing them in. So um, using, like the tuberose stem again and the amaryllis works well and oasis especially um anything that you can do to um when you have soft stems like for example calla lilies or smushy 
Sometimes when I'm designing, instead of relying heavily on Oasis or a full container of Oasis, I'll use Oasis with chicken wire so that I have some stability for the design, but there's also a water reservoir. So I will I will place those flowers that are I'm designing in uh, that I know they're going to have tr trouble in Oasis. I'll put it into a well of water in my design. I think the problem is Oasis in itself, um, too, people use a little bit too much of it. I mean, you do need, and I think we have a question, I don't know if it's on this one, but about how much Oasis and how to get it secured in the container. But if you use half Oasis and half chicken wire, it'll keep the stem secure and give you a little bit more space to put these bigger flowers in. Also taping calla lilies is another trick because they tend to curl on the edges sometimes and split. So that's something that you can do for those as well. Uh, it's just, you have to kind of practice and learn a few different ways with some of those flowers and make sure you put those amaryllis, bigger stem flowers, like big, big super callus, for example, or callus need to go in first because there's nothing worse than building this big design. And then you're trying to get that flower in and it's already delicate as it is. And yeah. so you need to put those big stem flowers in first. So that will help. Good tips. Thank you. Uh, I have another question from Barbara, and she says, when working with amaryllis, mm -hmm. I have used wooden, wooden and plastic dowels with wet cotton pushed up in the base of the hollow stem near the flower head. Which is better, wooden dowel or plastic? I'm, I'm going to go with Shelley's, let's all try the liatris or tuberose steps. That's ingenious. <laughs> Um, yeah. Either medium would work great if you have it available. Just be careful inserting it so you don't pierce the stem wall. I like that the uh, that you added some wet cotton in the end to give it a little bit of moisture in there. Um, yeah, the tuberose stems. <laughs> Good. You can, yeah, I love it. I, I do have it on our Mayish Carlsbad Instagram account. If you go back a few, um, I do the tutorial on it. And then, and then I tested that same stem. I kept it in a bucket and it was fine a week later. So <laughs> it's a great way to save your broken or bent cal uh, amaryllis. It's good. And I'll get Desi um, together with you, Shelly, so we can put it up on the blog too. So that way, once it gets yeah. buried on Instagram, we have it somewhere to okay. easily find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. yeah. It's, it's, I, it's necessity is a mother of invention, I always say. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Floral. <Yeah. laughs> good, good stuff. Um, Courtney asked a question. She said, How do you do uh arch, arch installations foam free? Um, and I put a few links in there, Courtney, for you. So we have, um, Christy did an Arbor video that she used um, a product called EcoFresh Bouquet Wraps. Mm -hmm. And so we'll post the link for the video so you can see that and then the link for the EcoFresh Bouquet wrap. So if you are interested, you can purchase those. Um, and EcoFresh is great. Um, they always send products for our workshops too. And it's, it's kind of like, uh, I always think back what Christy used to call them. She's like, they're kind of like a diaper for flowers. You wet, they're like this very, um, really cool technology for kind of like a paper type of thing um, that soaks up the water and then you wrap it around your flowers. And then you can also put like a little plastic wrap around it and then insert that. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there. And I don't know if you guys had any, any ideas as well, but that's, that was the first thing that came to my mind. Yeah, I always call them glorified paper towels, those eco wraps, because mm -hmm. they're really, they're so nice and thick. You can also, um, I used to do this a lot, is take cellophane. And if you're going to make little flower bundles for your arch, if you're not using ISIS um, cages, you can literally take the cellophane and cut it in squares, and then you wrap it up from the bottom. So if you have your little bouquet like this, so demonstrate. If you have your bouquet like this, wrap the plastic up around it and then rubber band it. And then you can actually fill it with water like a vase. And as long as you stay upright, they will not leak. And you can design on your arch that way and they can be tucked in. So if you need a heavier water supply, if you're out, if it's summer or spring and it's very warm, that will help on some things. Um, it's about the only way you can design without oasis on arches is to use some something like that or no flower or water tubes always are good, you know, easy thing to do, but yeah. it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's easy to use those as well. And they work just as well. 
Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I wanted to tell you guys an arch trick. A lot of you that have the light wire arches are not very, they're not super heavy. You can lay them on the ground and decorate them on the ground and then flip it back up and then done. So this is something you can do if you have trouble with like the ground sort of not stable or you have, um, you don't have the right step stool or height um, to kind of get up where you need to, but you can lay it down and decorate it first, especially easy to do this with greenery. Ah, right. that's such a great idea. <laughs> Look at you using your brain to design. I, I would be like, I can't reach. I don't know what to do. I've done this so many times. And the first time I did, I'm like, why did not I think about this before? <laughs> Amazing. Good. Um, I have a couple more questions in the agenda, but I just wanted to go through the comments real quick because I, I saw a couple come through and I think we're doing good on time. Um, I see this and I think this is a good one for everyone that's watching to kind of post what they do. But Penny says, how are we floors competing with the new paper flower walls? Um, that, yeah, I, I still see paper flower walls popping up. They've been around for a little bit. Um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that or what you see your customers doing or talking about these backdrop type of deals. Are you talking about uh, how do floors compete with people who want the paper walls compared to having flower walls or what, is maybe that the like what they're offering? Yeah. And in, in lieu of the paper, I don't know, but I, I think, think we'll go with, probably, I mean, I mean, I think it's a, a style preference. People are, if they want that, they're going to order that. If they want flowers, they're going to order flowers. I think, I don't think people are choosing that look over flowers for, the cost, because I can't imagine it's cheaper. Flat, paper flowers are not cheap to make. So I think it's just no. a look. And a, it's a trend, you know. I mean, we can't have, we, as florists, we want to provide all of this, the florals. But if someone wants that look, then let go for it. Let them do that. And then do something else really beautiful in other areas of the wedding. Uh, or incorporate some fresh or greenery, some, uh, some greenery to that or help them make it look a little, I think they, they're like, they're very pretty, but they can sometimes look a little crafty looking. So I think, uh, yeah. you know, as a florist, you might say, if your client wants that and say, well, maybe we can uh, offer some greenery or something to kind of give it a cool look as well. Or drives, you could definitely work drives in some of the cool preserved mm -hmm. bleach drives would be fun. So you can get your product in there some way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think just making sure that, you know, if the whole wall thing is still popular in your area, in your market, just making sure that you're posting like your, your version of that, your, your yeah. flower wall and the greenery backdrops and everything, you know, from like the simple things, like with just a little bit of greenery um, to like the full blown walls, you just have to make sure that people are aware of that to compete with that and be able to sell that upsell to your customer. Um, let me go through and see what else. I saw a question in here about whether or not we ship. I don't, I can't find it right now. So someone asked, I don't know where I went. I don't see it, but someone asked if we ship flowers. Um, and yes, we do. We ship nationwide. We have two shipping departments, uh, one in LA and then one in Miami. So Miami typically handles everything on um, the eastern part of the United States and then LA will handle the, the western part of the United States. Um, so that's that's what we do. So if you are interested in that, you just need to, and hopefully Desi will post this link too, you just need to register and then we'll get you hooked up with someone and then we can talk about how all of that works. But um, they can do FedEx, airlines, um, sometimes depending on where you are, we would have a, even a truck that goes through there. Um, but those are different options that you would discuss with your shipping rep since I am not that, um, I'm not uh, the most knowledgeable person. I know a little bit to be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I know enough to talk about it generally, but I, it's a, you know, lots of details that go into there, but definitely possible. Um, Penny, going back to the paper wall, Penny says real flowers bring um, an elegance that paper can't compete with. And of course, we agree with you, Penny. Amen, Penny. 
<laughs> and let me see. I'm just thinking. Uh, is there, I'm looking. Well, they asked there about uh, calla bouquet. How to work yes. with calla? Yes. Do you, uh, you want to talk about that real quick? Callus, yeah, just they have a tender stem, so they work best if you do the spiral bound bouquet technique, where the flowers lay against each other. That really does help keep them from um, bending and smushing so easily. If you're doing a gathered bouquet, which is crossed then mm -hmm. you're going to have a little bit more struggle with them because they're going to bend against the the stem so a spiral a spiral technique works best for callas you could also reinforce them with wire and tape you can just wire and tape the whole stem just like you instead of not taking the stem off but just just um, do a loop wire against the stem and then tape it that'll give it a little bit more structure but a lot of people have problems with flowers breaking when they do the the cross hatch sort of garden style Good, good, thank you. Yeah, and that that question was from Kirsten. I was able to find that. I don't know why I was having an issue. They're, the heads are so much hardier than the stems. It's a little frustrating with callus sometimes. I know many of us have gotten them where they become smishy, slimy on the ends. If that happens to you, just cut the head off and tape and wire it. They hold up great. So if you use them in bouquet work or boutonnieres or corsages, don't, don't be sad if you're, I mean, it's not good if the stems go mushy, but the head usually will still perform that stem for a while. So you can take them wire it and then just tuck it in. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, and then I had one other question that I saw and I'm not, I'm not sure about this, but Veronica wants to know what is the best way to dry and use veggies and fruits in holiday arrangements? Um, there about that? Many ways. Yeah, there's many ways. Actually, pomegranates will air dry by themselves pretty well as long as they're their um, outer skin hasn't been pierced. So will many weavy pumpkins. Uh, surprisingly, we accidentally dried some in our garage. We didn't know we were they were in there and they air dried beautifully. They were gorgeous. I've used them for three years in a row. Um, but you just have to experiment. Like I said earlier, artichokes dry will, really well. You can slice oranges and dehydrate them on a low setting in your, um, your oven. Or if you have a dehydrator, you can do almost anything with dehydrator. Uh, sweet peas um, or peas dry really well that way. It's just that you make sure you have a good um, air, uh, uh, I should say ventilation around it, or that they're not on top of each other and they're dried out separately. Drying in the sun is a great way to dry things. Just be mindful of um, pests with fruits. So make sure fruits and vegetables you're going to have them outside. You want to make sure there's no moisture on them and that you're watching them. And then I've even, after I've dried, one of our clients brought us these really amazing sunflower heads and I dried them, but they started going moldy inside. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to lose this. And I sprayed it with bleach and it killed the mold. And I kept turning it in the sun and it dried beautifully. It's so pretty. So when, since you're not eating these things and you're not doing anything with them, you can spray them with bleach too, to a bleach water solution um, and then you will it'll help kill mold on it as it's drying in the sun it's usually the best for that but yeah a dehydrator works really well or your oven too awesome thank you all right i'm moving on to our last couple of questions so uh this one is from je and they want to know how they can become a retail seller and how to buy from a wholesaler which i thought was was interesting. So I feel like a lot of people um, are just when they're new to the business, don't really understand how this process works. So do you guys want to take that? Uh, well, just because I've gone through it a couple of times, you just have to look um, at your city state regulations for opening up a business. Usually you have to apply for business license. You have to post that in the local newspaper. That's part of the requirement and that you're, that you're you're having business in the business's name and then you have to get a resale license we only sell to uh, registered florists who have a resale license so if you're um, Joe public and you're walking in and you don't have that you're not going to be able to purchase from a wholesaler generally some will make the allowance but um, we what all you need to do is make sure you get your resale license that resale license enables you to sell to the public so mm -hmm. we are a wholesaler you're the retailer. And we have a lot of people who are confused also about sales tax. We should also, we should maybe address this one, one episode, but yeah. um, do you, are you are collecting sales tax from the public. So make sure you're paying that to the board of equalization. Um, 
But once you do that, it's pretty simple. All we need you to do is fill out the, the registration form here and submit your resale license and you are good to go. Yeah. Yeah, I think so there's only four states that don't require the sales tax thing. So I don't know how they do that. I know Oregon is one of those states and Alaska is another one. Um, but in most cases, you can go online to your Department of Revenue and it has all the information you need there. You can download the forms. In some cases, you can actually sign your business up online and pay all your fees there. And then yeah. um, it's just a matter of obtaining that resale license number. And that's what we will require when you open an account with us online. Yeah, and as a yeah. new baby florist opening up or anybody opening up a business, and please um, educate yourself on how sales tax works. We have so many florists that come in, they think that if they pay the sales tax to us, they don't have to pay it, um, but that's not the case. You have to report your earnings to the BOE um, and then they, ba they base that off that you owe us tax. So you don't want to be taxed twice. So you don't want us to pay us tax, but then you still have to pay that tax at the end of the, the year or the quarter. So a lot of people don't even realize they're supposed to collect sales tax. And you need to make sure that you are doing that as well, because you will have to pay it whether you collect it or not. So, <laughs> and they are worse than the IRS. <clears throat> believe me, people, they want their money. So make sure yeah. you're paying it. <laughs> right. And then if you really do have a, a lot of questions, I think this is a good piece of advice from uh, Kirsten is ask your CPA. If you have an, a, a business, please get a CPA because there's so many different business laws and things like that, that you just need to make sure that you're aware of and you know how to set up your business properly. And you want to do that on the front end, not the back end, because otherwise your life is going to be a nightmare for tax time. <laughs> so I think just talking to your accountant, and your CPA is a really great advice. Thank you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of florists are creative, artistic minded people, and they don't always think want to think about the business part of it. Not saying that there aren't really great business people as are in this community, but if you can get a good CPA, accountant or bookkeeper, or even if your partner is that and you are the creative force, let that person do their job and you do your job and don't, you know, try to mess that up. Because I think that's what most florists have the problem with the money push it back until they it's they're like ah i'm hit with this now so yeah, yeah. when you're when in doubt call your managed location that's nearest you or, and and ask them how they go about doing it because if you're shipping there's different requirements and per se let's say you're shopping with me in arizona um then we have a specific set of requirements that you have to have in place to shop here so it's a little bit different from state to state yeah, and and I have um, a really great expert in pretty much all of the states. So her name's Jen McJunkin. She's on my team and she handles all of our registrations. She's amazing um, and she handles all the branches. So she's like kind of the first person that you will meet if you're new to Mayish. And um, so she's got her, her arms wrapped around all of that for all 50 states and even international things. So go Jen, shout out to Jen. <laughs> Love you, Jen. <laughs> I love you. Um, I have one um, uh, marketing question that I wanted to talk about, and it's from Erica. And she says, do we need to build an email list? Girl, yes, you need an email list. You need some way to track all of the incoming leads that you have and build a database so that way you can um, communicate with people. And, you know, I'm not sure what part of the business you're in, but if you're a retailer, like a traditional retailer and sells everyday types of things, you want to be able to communicate. And email is not dead. It's still very important. Um, but as you're building an email address, then think about other ways that people like to communicate, whether that's messaging um, or through the social media type of thing. But always collect email addresses, always create that list so that way you can reach out to people. Um, because it, it does help. And even, you know, with, for example, our things that we do, you know, people want to know about all the different specials. Um, so, and 
our new blog posts. They can subscribe to that. We send out the newsletters, um, all the great content. If we create like a new download, we need to make sure that people know about that. Um, so, and it, it go, the same goes for your, for your businesses as well. So um, that's my advice. And to get started, you know, we moved away from MailChimp. Um, not for any other reason other than the fact that I wanted it integrated with a CRM. So I'm um, using HubSpot right now. So if you want, HubSpot's a really great resource for any kind of marketing content too. They have lots of great resources and downloads and things like that. So if you're really into wanting to get um, better at that, HubSpot's a great place to go. So, but we used to use uh, MailChimp and there's so many other kind of services like platforms, uh, email service providers like MailChimp, um, but they're one of the biggest and they do a really great job and they have easy to use templates and um, forms so that way people, you could put a like subscribe form on your website and make it really easy or send a link to people as a follow up. Um, that way they can subscribe and, and you can have them in your database. So. I hope that answers your question. If you have specific questions around that, just let me know because it's already 11 o'clock, guys. <laughs> that hour goes by so fast. And um, so I'm going to let Dave and Shelly go and I'll do my wrap up. So thanks, guys, for joining me today and helping answer all these questions. You guys are awesome, as always. Happy thanks. Thanksgiving, everybody. Enjoy Happy turkey. Thanksgiving. <laughs> all right. Bye, Dave. Bye, Shelly. Bye, John. All right, guys, it's just us. Um, and that's a wrap. Again, happy Thanksgiving. I hope you guys enjoy the holidays and make sure that you save the date for December 11th and join us for our next show. And again, thank you for joining us. I'll see you soon. Have a amazing day and happy Thanksgiving. Bye.